topic is about every pastor being trained. My passion is about every pastor being trained. I remember a story. Uh, I've had a few mentors in my life. Some of them are live mentors and some of them are dead. Uh, Hudson Taylor was a dead one, but one that inspired me. I read uh, a lot of his books. I read the biographies, his big ones, little ones, and uh, it gave me a lot of encouragement. And I remember one of the stories that he told that sort of impacted his life and has impacted my life. Uh, one time, I think he was in China, uh, early days, uh, he was going someplace on a boat, a junk, they called it. And uh, he was on deck. It was, a, I think, a fishing boat. He was on deck trying to get to another city. And he started sharing uh, his faith with this Chinese person. And he, the person was really interested. Uh, he'd never heard the gospel before. He was open, but he wasn't ready to really trust Christ. But he said he wanted to know more. <clears throat> So Hudson Taylor was up there, and he went down, I think, to get a track to give him so he'd have something to read, and then he was going to meet him again in the city. Well, when he was down there, he heard a loud noise and a splash, and he, and he ran up, and there was a lot of yelling and stuff, and here this person he'd been talking to had, been, had fell overboard. And he was in the water, and he was trying to do something. Nobody was helping him. Everybody was just looking at him and watching him drown. Well, Hudson Taylor, of course, he said, oh, man, this guy needs to know Jesus. He hasn't competed. So he jumped over the edge of the boat. He dived in there. He dived in the water, and he looked under, tried to look under the water. Of course, the water, if you've been seeing water in China, it's not very clear, but he's under the water trying to find this guy, and he can't find him. He comes up. And he gets out of the water, and he's still, we got to help. we got to save this guy somehow, because it's not very long. And he sees another boat over there, and here's a boat of fishermen. And he knew, well, if we can use that fisherman's net, we can get this guy out of the water. So he calls over to the fisherman and says, hey, can you help me? Can you save this guy? He says, we're busy, we're fishing. And Hudson Taylor thought for me, he said, well, I'll pay you. I'll pay you $5, which is a lot of money in those days. Oh, it's not enough. We're busy fishing. We don't have the time to mess around with it. And he said, well, look, I have $13. It's all I have. And he says, well, you take that. And they said, no, we want 30. And he said, well, that's all I've got. You're going to get nothing. All you're going to do nothing. You're just going to throw that thing down, and I'm going to give you the $13, and it's over with, no matter what happens. So they finally said, we'll take the $13. They throw the thing over the side. They pull the guy up and within 30 seconds. They pull him out on the thing. Hudson Taylor tries to revive him, but he's dead. Now, <clears throat> the callousness of these Chinese fishermen really impacted Hudson Taylor. In fact, he was probably really angry. But as he began to reflect on it, he says a lot of us are like these fishermen. We're busy doing things that are okay, but we're neglecting people who are drowning and dying and are lost, but, and I got to think about that in my life, is that we have today millions of pastors that are languishing without training, trying to do a task that they're not fitted to do, and we are not doing much about it. That's always bothered me. And that's why I have this passion. Every pastor is trained. Uh, this is what I think about at night. This is what I think about in the daytime. I've been thinking about this for 40 years. I actually, I thought about it before that. <laughs> and it, and uh, we have to, some way, together, as the body of Christ, solve this problem. And we cannot do it the way we've been doing it or it'll never get done. So that's what I'm excited about this, the time that we have together, <clears throat> is that we want to, as uh, men and women in this room, we want to at least solve this problem in the Philippines. And hopefully, this is my vision for you, is you, is you go beyond that. Because you have the capacity not only to solve the problem in the Philippines, 
but to help in other countries. So I want you to think about that. We didn't talk about that today. That wasn't one of your goals, how many countries you can help in or what other areas outside of the Philippines. But I want you to think about that because that is the task before us. Today, <clears throat> somewhere between two and a half, three million pastors have no training. Well, not just the pastors don't have training, all the leaders in the church and their churches don't have training. So we're not talking about just the pastors needing training. We're talking about millions beyond that. And we have something today that um, uh, is exciting. Uh, there's a movement to fill Jesus' commission to the church. It's going around the world. And <clears throat> as you read the scriptures, all of you are familiar. I'm, everything I'm going to tell you today, you already know. Because the things that are important, we need to, we need to have before us all the time. In this passage, the great, what we call the Great Commission, I'm going to call it today the Jesus Commission, this thing inspires me every day. I've never got tired of hearing it. And every time I'm down, I read that passage. And I say, that's what God's called me to do. And it's not finished. So here we have Jesus saying, first of all, all authority is given to me. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Because of uh, Christ's death on the cross, because he shed his blood for us, because he was the ransom that we might have life, he was exalted by God the Father, and he has authority in heaven and earth to do anything he wants. And you want to notice that this, the, the thing that he wants most is that people come to know Christ, and that they mature in their walk with Christ, and that they're shepherded by a pastor. So he's given us authority. He's commanded us to evangelize the world. And this passion to evangelize the world... Uh, it's been part of the church's focus ever since it started. We know that someday, as we see that great passage in Revelation, that there's going to be people from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping Christ. And we're going to be a part of that great audience. But we're not yet there yet. Now, today, there's a thing called church planning movements. The last thing I read about it, there were 672 church planning movements with four streams of multiplication. And within less than a year, there would be 900 church planning movements with four streams of multiplication, which means that the church is multiplying rapidly and it may even multiply more rapidly. And if we have... If we have 5 million new churches by 2020, which is the goal of the CPM movement, uh, we can praise God. That means that in every main city in the world, there will be churches planted where there's not churches today. That means that in every people group, there will be a church. Now, they may not make 2020, but they may make 2025 because we're closer than ever before. We are mobilizing more people to go into places where... The gospel has never been heard than ever before. We're preparing people. We're, we have better abilities to translate the scriptures. And we have a place today that maybe we will reach every place on earth by 2025. Now, we all, all of us should be thrilled about that. We should be jumping up and down because this is part of the calling. But at the same time, that's only part the evangelization is only part of it. We know that. But the other part is teaching them to observe all that. Like, this is training. And this is what we're about, most of us. And that doesn't mean that we're not involved in evangelism. That doesn't mean that we may not be involved in church planning. But if this part is the part where we do not have enough energy, another, we don't have 672 church health movements. And we need them. 
But you do have a church health movement here, which is exciting to me. And my goal and topic is to have a church health movement in every country in the world. Now, that's a, at least every country that needs it. So a couple hundred. So we got a ways to go. We have a few, few of them now, but we don't have enough. And the problem is, in this task, it's, it doesn't get the highlights. It's not the things that people want to give money to, unfortunately. It's, it's much easier to raise money for evangelism than it is for training. You probably have experienced that. Somehow people respond. And I understand that, to people getting new life, life's transformed, becoming into the kingdom of God, becoming a child of God. But we, when we talk about training, doesn't have the same oomph, doesn't have the same sparkle, but is, is needed just as much. And we have to wrestle with that. But there are, we have to find ways to make it happen. So this is part of it. The other part, which at my age, this is important. We continue until the job is finished. Jesus says at the end of that, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Well, the end of the age hasn't come. We know that when everybody's reached, there's a possibility at that time that Jesus will come. But until that time, we have work to do. I would be glad if he came today. <laughs> but I'm not sure the task is done. It was sort of like Paul, and he's saying, as he was getting older, he was saying, boy, i sure like to be with Jesus. It'd be a lot better for me. But better for you that I stay. And I think that's part of our ministry thing. It's better for those that we serve that we are here giving our life for them. So we all know that. And the question that, that uh, Nick's question is, how are we going to do it? How are we going to train Five million, 10 million, really 10 million. I think we need 10 million because churches need people that are trained, not just the pastor. The only way we're going to do it is through multiplication. So I want you to turn to the passage that all of you know, passage that still I think about a lot, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, just to refresh us. Paul says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. God's method, I think, is multiplication. We talk about church planning having streams of multiplication. Church training, pastor training, should have streams of multiplication. We shouldn't be content just to train one individual. Every individual we train should be able to train others. If they're not, we've failed, as far as I'm concerned. That's part of our task, equipping those that we train to train others. Now, we know that if you look at this, we, could, we have three generations or four generations, depending. You, you could have the, what God gave to Paul. Paul gave to Timothy. Timothy gave to faithful men. Faithful men gave to others. But basically, we have three generations here. We have Paul to Timothy. That's us to our students. We have our students teaching faithful men. We have the people that they teach teaching others. Multiplication, four generations, three generations. And so every time <clears throat> that I, in BE, my past ministry, is when we started training, everybody we trained had to be committed to training others. And we trained them how to do it. And everybody that they trained, at least while we were with them, had to be committed to training others. So if I trained 10, I got 100. That was in the first thing. I trained 10, they had to train 10, that was 100, those guys trained 10. So every group I got, we had, and originally we had 1,000 people. The places that I've been, the tremendous multiplication of the church, no training, and that's the only way you can get it done, multiplication. 
But you have to do that with a focus. Now, the other thing that we see here, and, it, it, and this is, we know this, is that knowing, being, and doing. This is the things that you've heard from me. That's tr biblical truth. And trust this to faithful men, that's men with character, that they'll be able to teach other. That's ministry skills. Training others to train others, knowing, being, and doing. So these things have to be a part of our training. If all we work on is knowing, it's not enough. If all we work on is ministry skills, it's not enough. We, as we learned last night, we have to really focus on developing character. That has to be a part of our training. We have to know that the students that we are serving, the pastors that we are serving, that they are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And that's a part of what we do, knowing, being, and doing, all three of them. And if your program doesn't have all three of them, get it in there. If not, you're gonna just do part of the job and you won't be able to multiply. Okay, God's strategy of multiplication. The second thing is agreed upon curriculum. Now, Paul said, Timothy, you teach the things I've taught. So Timothy knew exactly what to teach. <clears throat> we should know what it takes for a pastor to be equipped. We should know the outcomes in every area that we teach that helps a pastor to be equipped. And we should look at some kind of template, which I'm working on, that will say, hey, we, we have equipped this pastor. So when we're talking about pastor training, it's not just pieces. This is the thing that bothers me sometimes we talk about pastor training. Maybe the only thing that I do, and it's good, and we need to do it, is mentoring. But that's not the whole thing. Maybe the only thing I do is teach New Testament survey or preaching. That's not enough. The pastor needs the whole thing. And so we should have in our mind what it takes, at least the essential, basic curriculum. I'm not talking about content because it's much more in content. Content's a piece. Remember, that's just the knowing side. We should know what it takes and what we're trying to accomplish to know that a pastor is trained that he can effectively shepherd God's people. That's what we're about. We don't want to just give them a piece of it. We want to give them it all. And we should be thinking about that. And we should have some kind of template in our mind. And that, so if we had that, 12 areas, it doesn't matter who supplies the curriculum or the course for that area as long as it's covered. So here's one thing I want you to think about. Here's what I've been thinking about. I think every pastor we train needs a portfolio. He needs to, to know the things that he needs, and we need to be able to check it off that he has it. The knowledge, the character, and the ministry skills. So I want you to think about that. Maybe they'll give you some things to ponder uh, when you leave here, because that's what I'm thinking about. Because when I go to a country which is, which is my task, is to create another Philippines uh, topic group in every country. Uh, and we talk about pastor training. We need to know what we're trying to accomplish and what is, a, when is a pastor trained? If we don't know that, I don't think we'll ever finish the job. And for multiplication, our training needs to be transferable. Everything that we teach, our, the one we teach should be able to teach others. So the way we teach is important as well as what we teach. And it should be reproducible. That means that if I give them a course, they should be able to have, have a copy of it to give to their students. And their students should be able to give it to their other students. So either you use the you know, PDFs, internet, printing, whatever, but you have to make sure that multiplication is possible. So when we, in, my, in, the, 
in my past, we made sure that not only the people that we trained had access to our curriculum, but that everybody they trained had access and everybody that the other ones trained would have access. Because that's the only way you get multiplication. Because in most places, and with most people, they can't do it themselves. They can't write their own curriculum. They can't produce their own stuff normally. You have to help them, and you have to make that available some way. That, that that's probably has some financial considerations, unless you're doing everything on phones or, or tablets, or, which is also a possibility, because for, for us to reach millions of people, we're going to have to do it differently. But, but we need to think about what's, is our training transferable and it's reproducible? Are we equipping the people that, so they can equip others with the training that they've had? My experience, I work with guys that have all been mostly seminary trained. They've got PhDs and MTHs and MDivs. And most of these guys are not creative. And they don't want to write curriculum. They just want to train people. And they're good. And they know how to do it. But there's a few that have the gifting to do the other. And we need to develop that, too. There's a few that can write curriculum. There's a few that can be creative. But don't expect everybody to do that, because it's just not. Not everybody can be a, a leader, either. I mean, I've worked with guys that have all kinds of competencies, but that's not what they have. So don't, you know. Sometimes we need faithful men who can do faithful work with what God has given them and what you've provided for them. And, there, and that's where we can get multiplication. If, ever, if everybody doing training tries to write a different curriculum and tries to reproduce it different, we are creating a mess. Think, I want you to think about that. You know, if you're starting a ministry and you, and you don't have curriculum, go get it from somebody who's already done it. Don't start the process. It'll eat your life. It took, took me 10 years twice, 20 years working in curriculum, and it's a hard process. It takes not just writing, editing, redoing it, testing it, coming back again, translating it if you're doing multiple languages. I mean, it is a lot of work. And, but our main focus is to train the pastors. And personally, I don't care what curriculum it is. I mean, I can use about anything that somebody has that's decent to train people with. So I don't care if it's my material. I just want to get the job done. And we need to have more of that in the body of Christ because we don't have the time and energy to recreate everything. Okay. <clears throat> this is simple. You know this. But I just want to reemphasize, you are God's plan for pastoral training for the Philippines. That's why you're here. That's why God has called you. That's why he's put it on your heart. Part of my, uh, when I came to this conference, uh, Pastor Hill said, well, what, do, what do you think ought to come out of the conference? So what's your expectations? So my dream, if we can call it a dream, vision, whatever you want to call it, is that within the next few years, you will train every pastor that needs training in the Philippines. Can you imagine if you accomplish your task, the two-year task, and you have 5,000 trainers, and they each train 10 people after that? That's 50,000 people being trained. That's 50,000 pastors. It's achievable to, to get the job done here. And my dream for you would be that you are the first country in the world that I know that every pastor is trained and that every pastor that comes up will get trained that you have developed the possibility and I want to if I want to share this all around the world I need a model that can encourage other people that will bring other people together in other places that they will be willing to work with each other to do the same thing that you're trying to do here so that's that's my expectation. That's a big expectation on you. But I'm excited that you've committed to start it. And if you get that done these two years, then you're going to have a snowball effect of multiplication. And you may have more people to train 
more trainers and more opportunities for training than there are pastors to train, which would be great on one side, but then maybe we can see a, a movement and a multiplication of evangelism too at the same time. So you can stay up with the process. If we can catch up and stay up, that would be fantastic. So this passage of, of Timothy, we know verse two, we do that a lot. Verse 3, we may not know as well. It says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Training pastors, equipping people to equip others, is hard work. We are going to have to suffer hardships to get the task done. And over the next two years, you're going to have to make some real decisions. And it's going to be hard to get it done. I mean, you think about it. Here we are doing the most, maybe most, one of the most important things for the church. Uh, we are in a spiritual battle. And Satan and his emissaries are going to do everything that they can do to stop what you're doing. You know, it's just not going through the process but there's the spiritual battle. And that's why I hope that you guys were talking about having prayer, people behind you in prayer. You're going to need it. Because this is not going to happen easily. And there's going to be hardship for every one of us. Every one of you are going to face hardships to get this job done. Now, there's, Paul uses three little metaphors uh, to explain what he's talking about hardship. He uses a big metaphor talking about <clears throat> hardship, but he, he's going to use these, these uh, for, he starts off with a soldier in verse 3, but he's going to also use soldier again, as you know. He's going he's to use the athlete, and he's going to use the farmer. And they're very pointed metaphors for us. Uh, you are God's soldiers. In other words, you've been called by him in a battle for the hearts and lives of people. And you are to respond to his authority only. If you think about soldiers, uh, most of them, especially in the heat of when they're when they're active, they live in barracks, similar to what you guys are in up there. Eighteen people in the deal. They don't have very many clothes. Only the only clothes they have is the clothes they need to get the job done. Uh, they don't get to go out and do other things. They don't get to go party. They don't get to go golfing. They don't get to watch basketball on TV. They don't even get to play basketball. They have a focus because they're an active service. Now, you wouldn't want an army that did all those other things protecting you, would you? And so in our thing, uh, to please the one to please our master, to please the one who's inscripted us in this battle, uh, he wants us to be single-minded and not let other things entangle us so we can't get the job done. I'm not talking about taking care of your family. I'm not talking about loving your wife, loving your children, doing the domestic things that are required of us because that's part of our calling. But there's other things that can eat up our time and life. And some of them are good things. But you could be using your, your, your energy for something that's more important. And it's a danger for all of us that we become entangled in the things of the world. We can say that. And there's all kinds of things in the world that can entangle us. Computers, text messaging, uh, the late. I mean, there's a lot of things that can eat your life. And you'll, you, hours will go away that you could be focused on. I'm going to tell you in the next two years, if you're going to get this job done, you can't spend a lot of time being entangled with other things. This is going to take your focus. You're going to have to be single-minded, just like the soldier. 
And we're also God's athletes. Now, most of us probably don't think we're an athlete. We might have thought we were when we were younger. Uh, but um, <clears throat> in Paul's metaphor here, if you, in the, if you had the games, uh, the, ro the games at that time, uh, the athletes would prepare for 10 months. They couldn't get into the games unless they signed a contract that they had been preparing for 10 months, and they had to work really hard. Now, I don't think that's what it's talking about in this passage. I think they're already qualified. They're in the game. They're ready to run the race. And the question is, <clears throat> are you going to run away to get the prize? Okay? The first metaphor, promise uh, God's delight in your service. This one promised you a prize, a crown. And Paul talks about that in chapter 4. He said, my life's almost over, but I'm looking forward to the crown that God's going to give me. So here we are, and it says we have to run, what? According to the rules. Now, we know that the Scripture gives us certain things that are important in our lives to be able to function as believers, to be able to pass on things. It's, it's character, it's love, it's forgiveness. We know those things. But sometimes... We forget. And if, but if we don't run by the rules, we will not finish the race. A few months ago, I was speaking to our staff, and I was talking about character. Knowledge and skills are important, but if you fail in character, you ultimately are wiped out of the race. You'll end up a shamble. You will not finish. And we see people all the time, people that are great, people that you've had here speaking probably in the past that are out of the race today. You never thought it would happen, but something happened, and it was in their character. So we got to run by those rules. If we don't do it, we won't finish the race. We will not get the crown. And God wants you to have the crown. He wants you to finish the race. He's given us everything we need to do that. We're not doing it in our own strength. He's supplying the grace every day. But we have to make sure that we stay by the rules. Farmers, number three. <clears throat> the farmer who works hard <clears throat> gets the first fruits. Now, I don't know. Some of you probably are farmers or you've been on farmers. Uh, <clears throat> that's one of the delights of my youth. I used to go to my uncle's farm in California, San Joaquin Valley. We produce, I don't know, 60, 70% of the produce for America. And my, my uh, uncle had a, he grew cotton and he grew okra. And I can remember as a teenager, I mean, I was 14 years old, I think, getting up at three in the morning, going out there and uh, help with irrigation. They had cotton rows and they had a big ditch here put water in that thing, and you had these pipes that you pulled on and with suction, you laid them down, they went down, and, it, and, it, and, it, and then it went to the next time. So three in the morning, when those finished, in the afternoon we moved those pipes to another row, and then at night we went out. After we ate in the dark, we did it again. During the day we went out and we weeded that cotton. 100 degree weather, you're out there with these hats on, these clothes on, so you won't get sunburned, you hope. And uh, you're out there plowing away. And you do it every day. During the season, you do it every day. Or else you don't have a crop. And if you don't have a crop, you have nothing in the end. So you have to stay at it. You have to work hard till it's complete. One of the things about a conference like this, or a good thing about, let's say the, a good thing about it is we get energized, we get challenged, God speaks to us, we resolve to do something, and then it starts. So, like we, we said, the real works, the real goal of this conference starts tomorrow, or maybe this afternoon when we leave here. In the first few days, uh, we will really be focused and, you know, maybe like the farmer, we'll get the seeds in. We may get the weeds out initially. We'll get things cultivated. 
But that's just the beginning. We have got to stay focused and we've got to work hard the whole time. And that's why when people talk about, hey, we need quarterly evaluations or we need monthly reports, you need it. So we stay on track. It's not like people don't trust you, but we all need that to keep going. We need encouragement. We need help from others. You're going to need all those things in these next 24 months. So it's going to be hard work. But if you do the hard work, you will see the fruit. You will have 5,000 pastor trainers. So these metaphors are simple, but they're very important for us. Single-mindedness, run by the rules, work hard. That's the only way you're going to accomplish your goals in the next two years. So this is simple. We have a humongous task. We have a humongous God. God wants pastors trained. We want pastors trained. And if we uh, will follow and stay committed to his commission and focus on multiplication and do it with single-mindedness, do it by the rules and work hard, we will have the, one of the greatest celebrations that you ever had in two years at this place. All of you will have fantastic stories about what God has done through you and in the lives of the people that you're serving. I can't wait to be here. This, this is already on my schedule. I'm, I don't think I'll book a ticket yet because I can't, but, if, um, but I'm going to be here. I mean, I, I'm waiting to see that. In fact, I'm going to come back probably in the middle just to make sure you guys are, uh, are, are going. Uh, so let's pray together. Uh, let's pray that, that God would really uh, help us to focus on what we've been talking about. And that we will give all of our energy together, encouraging one another, helping one another, serving one another to get the job done. And if you're having a struggle, don't be afraid to come to Pastor Hill or someone and get some help. Because we, we want, all of us, we want to help each other so that we get the task finished. And we can't do it alone. And some of you are in very difficult situations. You're, you're going to need things to make things happen. And I'm sure everyone here wants to help you to be, to fulfill your, what God has put in your heart, your goals for pastor training. So let's pray. Lord, we're uh, here today because you brought us together. Uh, we are overjoyed that we can participate with you in your purposes for the world. And we think especially uh, of your love for the church, the bride of Christ. Uh, very special. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of being able to uh, encourage and help pastors uh, be effective in uh, what you've called them to do so they can really feed the sheep because it's not only the pastors that you want to be seeing doing ministry you want the whole body of Christ to be involved in serving for you and Lord I thank you for every man here every woman that's here with a heart uh, to see the great commission fulfilled and especially on this part of training we pray that you would help each of us in these days to come to do the part that you've given to us that we would stay focused single minded that we go by the rules that we would work hard and Lord we look forward 
to a time of celebration, a time of fruit, a time of blessing, uh, because of your work in our lives. And that we are following your heart. And we just give you thanks and praise that we uh, have such a privilege of doing something together to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.